Thanks everyone for coming to the uh, Europe event uh, and for joining us today on our very interesting panel about uh, custody and regulation, which I'm excited to get into, uh, especially uh, on that specific point, which uh, I'm sure uh, our guests have a lot of stuff to speak about. So uh, perhaps I'll give uh, Courtney and Alex uh, 30 seconds or so to get into uh, maybe quick introductions about yourselves so that uh, uh, everyone knows uh, who you are in your background. So I'll start with the person I haven't heard introduce themselves a million for me. You have to indicate who that is. Um, <laughs> to, to oh, yeah. heard mine. I have heard mine a few times. <laughs> oh, guess that is me then. Um, <laughs> So, so um, I am a Courtney. I've worked um, in the financial services space for a good part of fifteen years, but only recently sashayed into uh, the crypto space, um, heading up the Mex Digital Venture, which is backed by the uh, broader multi bank group, one of the largest financial derivative organisations. Um, we're looking to, I guess, expand into the space because it's very clearly where opportunity is and I think it's the way of the future. And we've got an incredible team, um, both from the existing multi-bank team and, and some some very impressive subject matter experts. So I feel like um, we're really one to watch in this, in this space. Cool. Thanks, Courtney. Alex. Yeah, sure. So I'm Alex, co-founder CEO of Knox Custody. Um, we're on a mission to expand the amount of insurance capacity available to centralized custodians and private key managers. Um, and in our own right, we operate a custodian um, that seeks to allow our customers to gain dedicated insurance coverage for their holdings. Um, so today we hold Bitcoin on behalf of a number of customers who um, can, through us, purchase um, insurance coverage covering a wide span of risks uh, when we got started in the space. In our view, the insurance policies were not adequate to cover the kinds of risks that were resident in centralized custody systems. Um, and you know, step one was let's get uh, an objectively lower risk custodian up, um, and then from there see what it means to expand insurance capacity to be able to handle the amount of assets now held in centralized custody. Great, thanks, Alex. So, um, seeing that we're a small panel, I'll try to incite some debate, and I'll try to get. Uh, Maybe some interesting questions out of us and allow us to have just more of a conversation than a question and answer. I don't think anyone likes a question and answer. So feel free to uh, jump in, ask questions. Uh, hot takes are encouraged as well. So um, to stir debate. But I think I'll uh, put my first question again to Courtney to get things kicked off. Um, as this is a, um, a summit particularly dealing with Europe, with uh, with a strong Canadian and North American uh, kind of contingency here. A lot of times in the news, uh, we don't really hear about the challenges that's happening in Australia with respect to uh, cryptocurrency regulation and for companies like yourself to be offering the products that you want to be offering. I think it would be benefit for us just from a you know cross-jurisdictional analysis to hear you know, what the hell's going on in Australia and just to, yeah. To yeah, look, to, yeah look um Australia has a, a, a pretty admirable financial services regulatory regime um but a, it's really in its infancy when it comes to the regulation of crypto um we've we've really um I guess segregated the responsibility um of the financial services regulator and the AML KYC screening kind of um regulatory process and I think that's where the the regime is at with a real heavy focus on the legitimacy of the transaction um, not necessarily the financial service itself um, I think that Australia is very palatable to the space though which is encouraging um, because you've seen a lot of countries out and out ban it and I think that's remiss of them to make such a huge call on again what I believe is the future um, I think that Australia is, is, is again a very small market when it comes to operatives, but there's some, some huge um, murmurs. And I think that given the flexibility of the reg regime at the moment and the relative ease of registration, um, the ongoing 
operative requirements are, are huge, but I think any business that has any respect for regulatory compliance can easily um, integrate into the regime here. And I think, um, you know, a, again, we will see digital assets expand within Australia and see some notable players there because um, if it follows suit of your atypical um, financial services regulating regime, it's um, it's one of the best in the world. Although a small country, it's it's certainly um, up with the times and well respected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. So have we seen kind of the movement within Australia for, for instance, trading platforms that have to be registered as some sort of with some sort of dealer license, or has that not really taken? Shape. Um, yeah, look, look, digital assets in themselves uh, are not yet considered a financial service, but they are considered a financial product, right? So there's, they're, they're required to have AusTrac, which is the Australian Transaction Reporting um, Authority, a registration, and you're required to, to, to report your transactions and screen all of your customers, right? Which I think is the very baseline requirement. ASIC, um, which is the financial services regulator, will very soon, um, in my opinion, bring out a, a broad framework. But I think because the, the space is moving so quick, quickly, regulators are largely playing catch up with the requirements because they're understanding a completely new financial product. And to get that expertise and to build out a framework which isn't riddled with holes is, is no mean feat. And I think Australia wouldn't um, wouldn't want to fall flat on their face if I can say that, and 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 launch something that that was um, uh, uh, unfinished. So I do think that we'll see regulation um, broaden, but I certainly don't think that they will quash um, the opportunity because I think that even through the the players that that already exist in in the Australian market. Um, they know that it would be it would be cutting themselves out of a of, of a huge potential. Cool. Well, yeah, it's um, <clears throat> it's a bit of a different story than here in North America. We find if it seems that the regulators are uh, definitely looking uh, a little bit more favorably and openly to uh, to the actions, which you know I think everyone is, but uh, in, a, in a certain varying degrees. Um, Alex, do you have anything to add to that? I don't know if you have any. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think certainly you know, Tupac, you know, I speak about this at, at length, but uh, Canada is to some degree willing to, I don't want to say fall flat on their face, but um, unfortunately Canada was home to a lot of the biggest exchange um, losses, um, especially with Quadriga CX and some others. Um, and so the regulators have responded um, a little bit forcefully um, and we, we have to see how the dust will settle but uh, in many cases are making calls that uh, a lot of legal firms are saying you know are not are without precedent uh, but we'll see how that uh, how that shakes out yeah it's interesting how the quadriga cx kind of just changed the whole mentality and it's almost like uh, the regulators in canada have almost like a ptsd from it and are just uh, kind of overly reacting to what what had happened um adds for a little bit of flavor what, what do you think alex would take the regulators to kind of maybe quell their nerves a little and not have their you know, knee-jerk reaction to kind of try to over-regulate and extend their their jurisdiction um and maybe quell this kind of general tendency that we're seeing here yeah, I mean, I think certainly what we're seeing, um, and this is a pattern that we're seeing play out and hopefully continues um, being the case. I think that was a bit of a knee-jerk reaction, but when they looked inward, they realized that they had no real oversight into many of the players within the system. Um, and they started doing the most basic, just asking questions and seeing who is acting responsibly. Uh, it's my hope that the various responsibly acting firms can uh, point at one another, explain how they're working together, um, and explain how we're progressing as an industry, and that the regulators will be happy to apply at least in the you know, near term a light touch and not um, you know cause a disturbance such that new entrants can't uh, come to play. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a great that's a great point, Courtney. Do you think that's more kind of uh, cooperation amongst the good actors, quote unquote, so to speak, and putting forward maybe a united front with some certain standards can prove beneficial not only in Canada but in other jurisdictions? Uh, yeah, yeah. Look, I do think that um, unfortunately uh, this space has 
tended to have a, a bit of a Cowboys and Indians land feel to it, um, uh, perceptive for people that don't understand it. And I think um, regulators, again, are always one to react because if they don't after a certain event, then it looks like they're too lax, but they generally can't get that that um, that stick yielded at the right sense, right? They, they overstep the mark rather than coming in where they should. I think regulators that engage in dialogue with the players in the space are the, are the most progressive regulators they are because they actually seek to understand um, and unify because at the end of the day, the regulators aren't anything without an industry to regulate and we um, as operative players clearly have a benefit in operating within a regulated environment because I think that is valued by the consumer and I think it's even more valued as this space evolves because, um, you know, you're seeing some 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 landmark kills here and i think that consumers are starting to see the benefit of dealing with regulated entities or entities that operate within i guess reputable jurisdictions um i do i do think that you know the industry as a whole is 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 has a responsibility almost to ensure that regulation if it's being developed in the in its infancy they they really put forth at least an effort to liaise with regulators to ensure that at least um you know there's some sort of push to make sure that it is a fair application of regulation rather than something that squeezes the life out of an industry before it's really started yeah, and uh, maybe Alex, have you ever had any experience trying to convince the like regulator of your opinion? I know you have some strong opinions, but uh... no, I mean I think yeah, it's 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 uh, exactly as Corny says. I think it's on us to make sure that we are communicating with them and that they're communicating with us, and that um, you know they come to understand how everything is shaping up, um, and that we don't end up producing legislation that is injurious to the industry um, and. To Courtney's point, it is a bit of a ratchet mechanism. Uh, once these laws are in place, it's very difficult to reverse. And so it's important that uh, we don't be, you know, as with regulators and others, be too heavy handed in what we apply. So, so Alex, we obviously know each other for a long time and we had many, many debates on the subject. One of my favorite debates that I love is your case on why, uh, why Bitcoin should not actually be, does not actually need to be held by a qualified custodian or that actually a technology service provider doesn't need to be a qualified custodian and registered. Now, you know, all disclaimers aside that this is not legal advice and just for uh, <laughs> your uh, informational purposes only. Can you give us a case uh, uh, on why you think that, um, you know, Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin custodians don't need to be uh, regulated under under the qualified custodian uh, label. Yeah, well, I think certainly under National Instruments 31103 and 81102, I wouldn't say, for example, 81102 makes it pretty clear that for publicly listed funds um, that are physically settled in Bitcoin, um, a qualified custodian is in fact necessary. Um, I do believe that it is overstepping to start calling, you know, Bitcoin held in centralized custody um, a security, as many of the regulators have started coming down with. Um, I think perhaps to update Courtney, one of the movements post Quadrigo was really to say, well, the holding of Bitcoin with somebody such that you have the right to a withdrawal um, represents an investment contract, which represents a security. Um, and then suddenly that is another purview of the, of the securities regulators. Um, and so I do think that we should be, and this is perhaps a concrete example of where we should not be so heavy handed. Um, I would not say, for example, that a qualified custodian is not necessary under the you know, National Instrument 81102 context. And I believe even if I held that view that nobody would agree. Um, besides just the regulators, the um, the industry participants as well. Uh, but I do think we should be careful in not overburdening every player with um, securities regulation. And I think one of the most dangerous points here is that it would stifle the entry of new market participants. So many of the exchange and exchanges and others who are now looking at this, you know, they have the treasuries and war chests to fight and to be able to even um, get themselves up with the kind of regulatory machine necessary. Uh, but it will prevent new entrants. And this is um, a kind of situation that you typically don't want to see in a nascent industry. Yeah, I actually want to go back to that point in, in one second, but I do want to uh, raise uh, one member of our team who's been practicing securities law for about 30 years said that 
back back in the 90s they had a case as well on if you said was the printer producing securities when you went to make uh the share certificates there was actually a case in canada about that in which they obviously ruled not it was an interesting case in which you can use analogously um to our current context and i've spoken to folks like um like polymath who kind of hold that view where they say you know we're you know we're the we're the printing of the share certificates and not actually the issuers of, of the securities per se. Um, though I do want to go back to your point that you made, because I think you made a really interesting point here, Alex, where, and, I, and I'll pose this to Courtney and we can come back to you on it, is do you think this regulatory burden is actually creating a high barrier to entry uh, for kind of small actors? Because what we're seeing here in Canada is it's really only the wealthy and the large, such as the wealth simples and et cetera, that are really getting kind of this um, this treatment by the regu regulator, giving them exemptive relief and actually allowing them to operate uh, the way others may want to. And this is creating kind of, you know, an ability to, to stop maybe smaller actors from getting in. Do, do you see that as a problem? And how does maybe a person who's in that position as a smaller actor in the crowd, how do you think that they can kind of circumvent that or or dampen its uh its effects I'll, I'll pose that to courtney first yeah look i think um i think it's uh, obviously of uh, operating in a regulated environment like australia it's it's onerous and it's expensive um and you certainly need to be adequately resourced to be able to really have a, a, a step in the door here but it, i think I, I do think that that is burdensome. However, I do believe that there is an intrinsic value to that because I think, um, you know, as we've seen regulators start to sanction players, it, it's it's almost like you're you're operating kind of an, on, on rocky ground if you don't have solid infrastructure before because I think it's only a matter of time um, that it will be required. I do think that it would probably inhibit um, a, a number of players to to enter, but I don't think there's anything wrong with having a benchmark because I think that if we make the the, the bar too low, then regulators are just going to probably start executing and and making when they do you know set that bar, they'll set it way too high, which invariably will push the people out anyway. So I, I do um, I have a real um, a real soft spot for regulation because I think it's there for a, for a purpose. I do believe that it can be overburdensome, but I think the key is um, operating within environments where regulators are palatable, where they don't, um, as Alex touched on, try to make you know square pegs fit in round holes by trying to make your know, retrospective definitions fit a new era. Um, so I think it's 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 incumbent upon them to to really evaluate this industry in its entirety standalone and not apply archaic financial services law to it. And I think that's a process and I think that's a, you know, a long time coming, but I do believe it's necessary to really see um, this space evolve. Alex, do you hold that position or uh, are you uh, are you a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think I hold a similar position and I suppose Australia is fortunate to not have had the kind of incidents that Canada has had, I think. Mm -hmm. And this is perhaps a good lesson precisely for that point that um, completely unregulated situations like Quadriga, where you can surmise that it was an outright scam occurred. Um, and then as a result, the regulators then need to launch a perhaps over um, zealous response. And so had we had some oversight um, or at least some inquiry into the various exchanges and other actors within the space, um, then perhaps the regulators could have seen that entities like Quadrigo were not playing the same game that um, other far more responsible entities were playing. Um, and we wouldn't have perhaps the kind of um, potentially overburdened some frameworks like the introduction of the notion of a CTP and other um, such points. Yeah, and I think I think to add to that point, it's I think it allows for the serious actors to come out and it kind of separates who's serious and looking to actually mm -hmm. build a long-term business and who's actually looking to make maybe a quick buck, uh, so to speak, and and uh, and and I think that allows people to who are trying to be serious to actually put themselves apart and gives them potentially some market advantages vis-a-vis uh, vis-a-vis um, vis -vis other participants. 
but sometimes it doesn't seem like it, it plans out, right? Uh, I would say that we have situations where certain people have spent much, much efforts and time and money into getting themselves regulated, and then you know they see stories like uh, Binance posting 600 million, or was it 600 billion trades as in June uh, of last year? Um, it kind of creates a a bit of dichotomy there. But maybe going to more of a fun point that I sometimes like to ask. So obviously we have serious actors and then we have some not so serious actors. The not so serious actors sometimes are are looked at through the lens of securities law and looked at through the lens through capital markets. Or perhaps they should be looked at at a different lens because they're not really investments and they're more like gambling. I'm speaking more about the pump and dump. So Alex, do you think we should legalize pump and dumps in the crypto sense? I, I do not. Yeah, I do not believe we should legalize um, pump and dumps. And I think, you know, my view on uh, various cryptocurrencies, um, most cryptocurrencies, frankly, besides Bitcoin, um, that represent attempts to, you know, garner a lot of retail money uh, with no real intent to actually produce a return. Um, and so this is, for better or worse, at least the ICO Craze is to some degree behind us, uh, but it is something that we should be wary of. Um, and yeah, certainly I would not be on the side of uh, let's make sure to legalize um, what is ultimately injurious to retail investors. Gordy, do you hold that position? Yeah, sentiment concurred. I just think, um, yeah, I, I believe that, I guess speaking to my point earlier, that the, the bar needs to be set at, at some level. Otherwise, you know, we're never going to get out of out of um, the the perceived view that it is something that is nothingness, um, that is not a viable financial investment, um, and I think that you know the negative media that goes around with 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 some of these um, setups is 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 a far sight more detrimental to this industry than beneficial. So I certainly wouldn't be a fan. Interesting viewpoint. Just to show the alternative viewpoint, you know, I think looking at you know, the pancake swaps and, and the poo coins from a gambling perspective rather than any type of investment perspective. I think sometimes look through, looking through that lens might create another case uh, for them, but I do generally agree with you both, but uh, I'm just trying to get the hot takes out. Um, maybe, uh, maybe final question I would ask is, what do you think would be some dark horse uh, trends that are going to emerge um, in the next year or so from a regulatory standpoint, just uh, kind of uh, anywhere, whether your home jurisdiction or other countries, interested to hear what you think is, uh, is something that is not on people's radar and you think from a regulatory perspective should be on people's radar. I think certainly, I mean, I can speak to Canada. I think we've talked at length about the kinds of situations we're seeing with various, um, you know, exchanges and others who are being faced with potentially overburdensome regulations. So I think that's certainly something that we should be careful of. Otherwise, and I suppose I always have to remind people that even though I run a custodian, I still believe in um, people holding their own keys for their own coins. Um, and certainly a dangerous movement, should it ever occur, would be governments requiring people to not um, hold their own um, cryptocurrencies. So uh, the notion that you should not be self custodying is a dangerous one, I believe. Um, and we are seeing s some movements where um, there's perhaps too much oversight into what people's own um, holdings are. Um, cool. Thanks. And Cordy? Um, look, look, I think that the, the best thing any any business can do um, that that's coming into this space or even pre existing in this space is, is really um, invest in infrastructure at the moment because I think in most jurisdictions you've got a clear indication now of whether the regulator is going to play ball with this sector or not and I think um, it is only a matter of time in, in most of them that you are going to have those burdensome requirements inflicted if you're used to having nothing. Um, I think that building out a framework now will ensure that you can withstand whatever storm, whether that be a regulatory um, interest or otherwise. And I think that you know, really evaluating things like the partners you get involved with at this time. You know, really, you know, 
artillerizing yourself with good counterparts, um, reputable counterparts. So then you can really prove that if you're ever called to action by a regulator or otherwise, that you're 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 here to operate legitimately, regardless of whether there is a robust framework in place in the jurisdiction in which you're operating. Um, I, I don't even believe that you need to be operating in a tier one jurisdiction to do that. I think you can be offshore and still do that. I think that there is an innate appreciation from regulators and consumers for, for a business that knows what they're doing and, and values what they're doing as um, you know, a legitimate service. Great. Thanks, Courtney. I think, I think we're out of time here, but um, yeah, I, uh, I will leave it at that as I think it was actually a good, a good way to end it. Unless you guys have any uh, final points or questions to be made. Maybe actually I'll let you guys uh, plug yourselves a little uh, where people can find you on the socials or elsewhere uh, so that uh, you can rest connected. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, certainly yeah. feel free to visit noxcustody.com. And if you need dedicated insurance for your uh, Bitcoin holdings, that is a deep place to go. And look, Max Digital is developing one of the most progressive, integrated and regulated financial ecosystems. So keep an eye out for us. We're, we're making stake. Yeah, definitely uh, excited to see where you guys both go. And uh, yeah, on that note, uh, I'll leave you guys, I guess, to your days. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see you all uh, at some other event. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers, all. Thanks.